welcome to the latest episode of the Scottish Roadscast, a podcast all about Scotland's roads, bridges and motorways. I'm Stuart Baird. And I'm John Hassel. John, it's really, really good to see you again. We're back with our latest episode. Yes. Uh, The last one on the Clyde Side Expressway was a big success, so you a lot of pressure on you for this episode. Difficult act to follow. Yes. It's not going to all be on me, though. You're going to chip in here and there. It's going to be our usual dynamic duo. Yes. Well, this topic's one you've spoke about doing for quite a long time yes and we're finally doing it mm-hmm. tell us what it is I'm a little bit nervous about this one <laughs> no. so you well, should be you know uh, the Edinburgh trams that often gets uh, some bad press uh, back when it was being constructed well would you believe it there was a project that was even worse we're really going to talk about Edinburgh's road system specifically their proposals for something similar to Glasgow like they're in a ring road and things like that yeah, it's a story that we have often mentioned, but never covered in any detail. <laughs> we often throw some comments towards Edinburgh, how they were never able to get their kind of proposals off the ground. So this yeah. podcast is going to talk about what they proposed, yeah. when they proposed it, and what kind of started to go wrong, and some of the attitudes and things that yeah. came out about it. Now, it is a big, big topic, and something we're just not going to be able to cover no. completely in one podcast. You know, hell, it's probably even going to bring up more questions than it does answers hopefully but this is a start and we can maybe have a a revisit to this topic so is it fair to say that they bungled it yeah totally okay good that's a good starting point (laughs) by the fact that they didn't really build any of it i'd say that's a pretty fair that's a good starting point okay right take us away there well where did this all start similar to glasgow which came back in the kind of post world war ii periods they they had major problems in the city in edinburgh yeah. uh, with with traffic motor car private transport at this point was increasing uh, after the war obviously there was a big kind of zeitgeist sweeping the uk that they wanted to rebuild rejuvenate and edinburgh even though it was quite a historic very historic and medieval city mm-hmm. was no exception yeah so um they had kind of plans for an inner ring road system that started to come about which was first proposed in abercrombie's advisory plan of 1947 yep so that's the famed uh, town planner sir patrick abercrombie mm-hmm. renowned for town plans all across the uk glasgow and clyde valley included around the same time yeah so he and did he edinburgh also, and the fourth valley was he also not the man that came up with the uh new towns yes the, the yeah he was the guy who proposed cumberald east Cumbride, and others uh, Livingston and the like for Fantastic. For well, thank you, Abercrombie. Yeah. Um, so in 1947, they started to look at plans uh, which w- would encompass a road system. And two years later, in 1949, a plan was devised for an inner ring road motorway with radial routes, which were either kind of like an upgrade of existing streets or they were going to be new roads altogether. So this also included an outer bypass for the city. Mm-hmm. Does this sound sort of familiar it's sounding familiar to me because it also sounds quite a lot like robert bruce's plans for glasgow city center yes Mm. exactly so similar although they they looked at the two cities obviously in in a bit of a different way is that the bruce proposals while the road systems are very sensible uh, had that kind of wholesale demolition of the city center yeah they weren't really proposing that for edinburgh because edinburgh didn't really need it no you know it it was it's a very different kind of animal to to Glasgow. yeah so they came up with these uh, I've no other word to call it, Stuart, because it was rudimentary. Mm-hmm. What they had, um, the the proposals that they drew were this inner ring road and radial routes, and they had kind of various kind of names, outer bypass, mm-hmm. western approach road, yeah. and stuff like that. Oh, that's one we've heard of. Oh, yes. Uh-huh. We shall get yeah. into that. Okay. Um, but the plans were eventually kept being revised throughout and developed through the 1950s, 1960s, and ultimately into the 1970s mm-hmm. to refine these corridors that the new highway system would take. Yeah. So what is quite notable is as the proposals go on through the years, there are lots of changes in them in the fact that some of the routes are proposed to be in cutting, yeah, in cut and cover tunnel, mm-hmm. somehow taking environmental considerations in. Yeah. And why, why, why did they change and chop and change all this so much? Well, there was as you can imagine, huge resistance to these proposals that yeah. started coming out from, mm-hmm. from Edinburgh. Now, the local authority at the time, in the corporation that was in, in Edinburgh, um, they, I wouldn't say they, they demonstrated the plans in the best way mm-hmm. to the public. <laughs> um, they, they kind of kept these kind of hidden away because they knew they would be controversial. Yeah. You know, they didn't have in Glasgow where they had this comprehensive redevelopment of whole areas going on, which would accommodate a new road easily. They just didn't have that in Edinburgh. Yeah. You know, so it was 
whatever was going to happen, a good way of summing it up is people are going to be majorly inconvenienced yeah. by this. Or at least that was the thought. I mean, in, so it's like you say, in Glasgow, the sort of comprehensive development areas allowed for road construction on a scale that would have been unthinkable if you hadn't been clearing all those areas. Yeah. And in a sense, Edinburgh was kind of lucky that it didn't have the same levels of deprivation and, and, and slum housing and all those really high urban density levels that had to be considered and, and they were trying to improve all that. And so. they didn't have industry in the city yeah, centre either. Exactly. You know, you've got to remember the Clyde and the, the impact that had, yeah. had on, on Glasgow's proposals. And it was a very different animal. Yes, completely different. Have, have we been a bit unfair then in that case and sometimes kind of comparing the two cities when they are I so different? I always say that you can't really compare Glasgow and Edinburgh. Mm. You, can, you can compare Edinburgh with York like you can compare Glasgow with Manchester, but I don't yeah. think you can really compare Glasgow and Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh well. Mm -hmm. So when they were coming up with these designs, it was eventually decided, you know, that the they they appointed it to Freeman Fox and Partners to um, basically carry out. This was in 1968 as a kind of a transport consultant. Mm -hmm. So the, Freeman Fox and Partners were the designer of the Fourth Road Bridge and the Erskine Bridge. And the Erskine Bridge. There you go. So looking at these proposals there. Um, the remit of these kind of consultants was to prepare a transport plan which would ensure the highest degree of accessibility to the centre of the city for both public and private transport. So this, again, this was in the kind of 60s period. Yeah. Um, now, differing slightly because they are bringing in public transport into yeah. these kind of proposals now. You know what stands out to me here right away? Right. The date of that commission. 1968. Yes. So that's eight years after Glasgow. Now, so they were late to the game. By 1968, Glasgow was already starting to have trouble getting some of their proposals moved on. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. There's one this of the reasons I imagine that we're going to cover for things perhaps not moving forward very well. <laughs> okay. Well, as these things kind of go on, they... They initially confined their general remit to 16 grid squares by which the central area of the city was defined while the wider planning studies were committed to the town planning officer. So they were starting to look at different parts and sectors of the city and how they would start, you know, these things would be affected. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, what's quite interesting is that one of the routes that were proposed in this, so there's the inner motorway and you have this kind of eastern link. Mm -hmm. So this was the road that was to go out to the A1. Which, oh yes. Which, by the way, seeing these reports, is a one M. Yeah. So motorway they, class they, road. Motorway class road. Um, they came up with kind of proposals that were eventually pro like uh, approved in 1969. Mm -hmm. So this is the Eastern Link Road. They decided to have a public exhibition in 1970 of the plans to see what people thought and people who were going to be affected by the route. Mm -hmm. Now, I've got a great bit of material here that I've kind of taken a few, uh, that I'm reading directly from okay. and in some ways, and it's called Streets Ahead. Mm -hmm. And it's a brief study of the highway planning in Edinburgh since 1945. A and wonderful book. It's great. It, 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 sadly, I've only found out a bit about it quite recently um to be honest <laughs> with you. i've not read it quite cover to cover maybe i will for the next podcast but this was done by john gray um and he he'd done this in 1975 yeah you know and he was actually a solicitor that was involved in a lot of the transport policy and stuff like and, that. and a and a councillor on edinburgh corporation i think as yes. well he was one of the baileys through there yeah yeah so this this guy knows his stuff and he yeah. wrote this in 1975 about what what had happened you know you can only almost tell how this story is going to end mm -hmm. but anyway um here's here's a good thing uh a, a good little um transcripts really of kind of what happens when they presented these proposals to the public the public reacted violently to the exhibition <laughs> that his words? His that's his word violently. that's his what it's his words i'm quoting <laughs> the exhibition and the proposed new eastern link road came under attack from all quarters it was said that the scale was wrong the spurs and trumpets were too massive and too closely set together. And trumpets meaning the types of junction, yeah, yeah. you know, that they came in. Uh, were too massive and too closely set together. In particular, one of the spurs seemed designed to, to basically deposit a vast number of cars onto the Waverley Bridge with easy access to the centre of town. Funny that, since that's probably that's what the, the road was supposed that's to the do. Point yeah. of it, exactly. <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, and then, of course, this is the best bit. It was further pointed out that the Waverley Bridge spur was oriented to point across Prince's Street Gardens, giving the inference that the corporation intended to extend the motorway right through the gardens. Now, that's an interesting one, isn't it? Because I think in some of their earlier plans, 
there were proposals for a for a, a road or a, a motorway through Princess Street or below Princess Street Gardens. I've certainly seen that's plans for right. a tunnel. That, yeah. That's right. Mm-hmm. The thing is, is, this is a kind of hard story because they keep changing the proposals yeah. as, they, as they go through. And we'll, we'll kind of go over some of the routes in a little bit. But it's just, I wanted to kind of <laughs> give an idea about how outraged people were about these Violently. things. Violently. Absolutely. Violently. That's a good, what, good word. Yeah. What, what it is that the, they actually came up with this committee that was completely against the road proposals because although the corporation tried to keep this quiet in yeah. the 50s and 60s, uh-huh. it was getting out. Yeah. Um, and of course, there were these, these exhibitions. You know, in a way, that seems a shame because it's like Glasgow were obviously very open about their very highway proposal. Very, very open about their very, highway proposal. They were proud of it. Yeah, but Edinburgh almost like from what I'm getting, it was like a dirty little secret yeah. that they didn't want getting out. And it was yeah. like, well, I suppose we have to tell them. But yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So against the route that the North Edinburgh Joint Committee. So this was a, basically a pressure group mm-hmm. that was against the road proposals. Produced a leaflet which we have. Yes. Uh, that's called <laughs> "You and the Inner <laughs> Inner Ring Road Motorway 1966," which is obviously against the route, and said that the process for devising the route was managed by a department that was understaffed and overworked. <laughs> they also mentioned that schemes of a similar nature in the states, which of course, as we know. We had no standards of design yep, for these yep. things. So mm-hmm. A lot of them were American-esque, yep. okay? had failed to provide much benefit and proposed that a panel of consultants, which included architects, sociologists, and economists, are appointed. Okay. So these guys, I, I, they're not like obviously a modern pressure group that just hated all roads. They were obviously looking and going, no, something could be better here. Mm-hmm. Now, if we look again, refer to Glasgow, they'd already appointed yeah, the likes of Holford uh, from the art, beginning. From the beginning. From the beginning. So they didn't yeah. come up against these these problems yeah. and these kind of objections that yeah. came through. So um, where where is it heading? So let's summarise. <laughs> We've gone through the forties, fifties, sixties, and now into the seventies of these proposals, and not a bit of this road has been built yet. Yeah. Now I've spoken a lot about what's in the city and what people were complaining about is that. Also in the proposals was for an outer ring, mm-hmm. but this wasn't focused on first. They were more focused on building the inner parts yeah. of these things, and this is where they were going to come up with the, the controversy. But it always had an outer ring, which was, apart from a few adjustments, roughly on the alignment of what now is the Edinburgh City Bypass, the A720. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. I was looking at some of the, the figures you, you have before you earlier, mm. and I think that in the 1965 study, I think they, they predicted that through traffic was only something like 10% of total traffic in the city streets at that point. I'm a bit what? doubtful about that. Right. About whether that was really high enough. Because Edinburgh had the same problem as Glasgow in the sense that all of the major A roads converged in the city centre. They did. So people heading for the A1, you know, heading out to East Lothian, um, basically had to go through or near Edinburgh city centre, you know, yeah. skip around the south. Because there was no obvious route around the south of the, of the city you know you would take the a1 in and you would then run along princess street and take the a8 out the other side yeah. or the a90 to the north you know so it sounds very similar to london actually yeah. in some ways uh-huh. that you know before it, it, it done its road proposal and, and edinburgh of course is boxed in by the first of fourth to the north mm-hmm. and the hills to the south and you know what it's only exacerbated the problem in the 60s in some not that i'm against the fourth road bridge or anything but the fourth road bridge obviously opening in 1964 included southern approach roads mm. past down many and basically putting that traffic yeah. down under cram and brig yeah now there was no well, the city bypass to this day, uh, painfully, doesn't go up and meet it, the A90. It wasn't given enough strategic thought. It wasn't. It was just, all these cars, they're going to go in here. And that, that was making the problem worse. Yeah. So you're right. People were going through the city centre. Whenever these figures are to be believed or not. Hmm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. But we shall, we shall see. Mm-hmm. Um, Unfortunately, we don't have the same types of studies for Edinburgh that we had for Glasgow with those no. hundreds of traffic counts that were done. Yeah. And it quite quickly, even, even some of the, you know, you've got the desire lines from the 1950s mm-hmm. that you often present when we do talks that show where all the vehicles and all the cars and trucks were all trying to go. So I don't, you, you just don't have any of that. No, for, you for didn't. Edinburgh. They didn't yeah. have all the data to kind of, to kind of back up, yeah. I suppose, which made objection handling rather difficult. Yes. You know, so... This isn't going well. They keep changing the proposals. So what was coming was, as we're going through the 70s, there was a reorganization of local government. Yeah. So the corporations were being done away with and it was going to become uh, Lothian Regional Council. Yes. So they they had a, decided to have another roll of the dice with this one, Stuart. Mm-hmm. And they called this, I love the name, Schemex. 
Yeah. Schemex. Schemex. Mm -hmm. So Schemex. So following, it says here in, in this wonderful book by John Gray, it says, following upon the Eastern Link Road difficulties, the joint consultants, so it's Freeman, Fox and Barnes, mm -hmm. pushed them rapidly with their studies produced during in, in 1971, a preliminary report entitled Analysis of the Problem. So later that year, a second report entitled Alternatives for Edinburgh, mm -hmm. in which they recommended for further study and discussion a plan for dealing with Edinburgh's present and future traffic problems, which they described as Schemex. And Schemex was basically a stylized plan that embodied the best features which had emerged out of a series of alternate plans examined by the consultants during the course of their studies. So it included things like improved facilities, bus-only routes, pedestrianization of certain streets, which included Princess Street, by the mm -hmm. way, yeah. and a highly restrictive car parking policy. So this this is interesting. Yeah. They reacted, they pivoted to the studies, and the thing is, it's annoying, is they should have done this from the start. If, if only somebody had and looked and went, mm, the optics are not going to be very good on doing something like this, of the offside, and, and not wait for the public to turn around and say, look, what you're doing is a bit overboard here. You know, this the whole plan would have been a bit more palatable. Yeah. I, and, and I believe this is the this was the report, wasn't it, that was produced in conjunction with Buchanan and Partners. Yes, you, you mentioned that. So that was Colin Buchanan. Now just for, for for those listening who may have heard of Colin Buchanan, he was a Scottish town planner. Um, he is most famous for the production of of the report Traffic in Towns in 1963, which basically took a comprehensive view on the issue surrounding the growth of personal car ownership and the fact that there were lots of cars in towns, I think he was the first that really accepted that you could not build your way out of congestion. And he also sought to give some input and some advice and produce some ideas on what urban motorway construction should be like and how you should build them within towns and all that sort of thing. So that was their kind of involvement, I believe. It's quite funny to think that as early as that, as 1963... They were already seeing that urban motorways maybe weren't the silver bullet. Yeah, you know, and they're not. I mean, we we agree. I mean, they they are they are very useful, but they have to be done in the right way. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I'll continue a little bit about Scheme X. Yeah, um, that they say here what's different. The hierarchy of roads in this Scheme X was not superficially so different from the hierarchy of roads contained in the earlier plans from you know the fifties and the sixties. And many other features were not unfamiliar to the city planners. But the roads in the hierarchy fulfilled different purposes from which they had been intended in the 1965 plans. In certain vital respects, some of them were materially different in location and design, while the quinquennial review in a ring road was designed to cope with and distribute all motor vehicles with the destination of the inner core of the city or which wish to bypass the inner core, the consultants proposed in Schemex to restrict entry of, mo of private motor traffic to the central areas in at peak periods of commuter travel at the line of the intermediate circular route. So I'm talking about different things here. So they did, they proposed uh, this inner motorway box, which by Schemex they'd kind of done away with, and it was no longer going to be a motorway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it was just going to be kind of an upgraded urban route, an urban yeah. dual carriageway yeah. or something like that. But they did have an intermediate urban route crossing over, which was basically kind of where we think of the West Approach Road now, going out to this, this um, towards like the A1 that skirted around past like Cameron Toll yeah. and stuff like that. You, and for the benefits of people listening, on the social media, we will release these maps. We're so going to have, have to, look. because you're, yeah. just, you're listening here and you're going, where? where? Yeah, so yeah. we will put the maps up on the... On the the thread yeah. so, so it's interesting see. though i mean they, they did think and go well, hold on a minute we just can't dump all these cars in here yeah so they're starting to move away from the the city center um they they did i mean it says here the consultants propose comparatively little additional road space within the central area so it's all the the scary stuff i suppose as you would call it that yeah. like the motorway through the meadows yeah, yeah. stuff was beginning <laughs> was beginning to kind of evaporate at this point um and also you've got the car parking restrictions and stuff like that. And an additional uh, restraint on the number of cars which will penetrate the inner perimeter of the city. Um, I've already said, you know, that it's it, it has a kind of a bit of a diminished role within the central area. But what they started to, um, to, to kind of see here was that the outer bypass was going to be a little bit more buildable mm -hmm. um, that I'm picking up from this. And also they were going to put um, some of the roads in cutting and stuff yeah. like that as well. Yeah. 
So it does actually mention here, um, as the proposed new inner distributor road is designed to carry much less traffic than the old inner ring road, the consultants expressed themselves as satisfied that the southern link could run on the surface through the meadows and that no question of a tunnel or elevated highway would arise. So because it's not a motorway and it's not elevated, they thought about putting this southern link that would actually run the southern poach, which would go up to through the meadows. Okay. But it wasn't dramatic because the earlier proposals had that as an elevated uh, uh, motorway. Yeah, yeah. Pretty um, unthinkable, which, really. Which would have been fantastic. I mean, <laughs> you, have you ever been to the meadows? It's actually really nice and nice day. And you could imagine if you were there with the this hulking structure. And he's smirking as he's <laughs> seeing this. And you could hear every expansion <laughs> joint. Ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. I'm, just, mm -hmm. I'm winding you up, by uh -huh. the way. And I'm winding all our listeners I up. I quite enjoy a walk in the meadows, thank you. Good. And you, you, when we visit our friends at Historic Environment Scotland, that's right, next to the meadows, the other end of it, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. But anyway, <laughs> of, of its time. Uh, so, Scheme X brought the consultants new troubles. Along the line of the intermediate circular route, citizens who had lived for many years with its more remote predecessor now formed themselves into local societies determined to oppose the new threat to their homes and locality. Public participation had only arrived with a vengeance, it says here. Because, <laughs> I mean, that was the thing. Public participation was really just yeah. getting getting started as a concept in the early 70s. And I think it was 1973 that it became a requirement of the authorities to actually have public consultations, mm -hmm. you know, before anything, you know, any proposals were taken forward. So, yeah, very interesting. But it is, I mean, they eventually, the, uh, Scheme X... Uh, culminated in something that they call the the recommended plan mm -hmm. in 1974 and then of course 1975 yeah um with these new proposals now what i'm going to do now Stuart, is we're going to refer to our maps and if you are listening to this on the computer it's a good time to look at the map that we put on social media mm -hmm. so you can see here that the the kind of routes they let's talk from the outside going in they knew that the a90 was coming in from uh dalmeny from the yep from the fourth road bridge and what they've proposed here is a kind of a, a a new northwest approach that they've kind of altered which has these various spurs such as the granton spur mm -hmm. northern spur so you you get the road going actually up towards leith and if you look at the key it so has some additional the, routes so that's that's kind of a replacement for the is it the a199 the road that goes around the north of Edinburgh, isn't it? It's an upgrade. Yes, yeah, an that. upgrade it's of a, that. It's basically an upgrade of that that yeah. they've done. But if we go, if we continue along and we go out to what's that shopping centre? Is it Fort Canaid? Fort Canaid. Fort yeah. Canaid out there. In the east. It, it actually says now the Musselburgh Bypass, which is there to this day, yeah. which is part of the A1, is dual carriageway. Yeah. They actually have this single carriageway. It's an interesting one, isn't it? The single carriageway. Well, it's because the A1 was was also there, but that was going to go straight into the city. Yeah. Because the A1M is separate from the A1. Uh, and seems to be continuing as another, as another, as another route. route yeah. Which is utterly bizarre uh, yeah. in some ways. But there you go. And it says here as well, Eastern Approach reduced in size. So there is still an inner ring road of sorts, but it's single carriageway, mm -hmm. which is just an upgrade of, of roads. Apart from its, what could we call the east flank, which is an which is an upgraded road, which would have been a, a dual carriageway. Yeah. Now they have this southeast approach that would have been in a kind of cut and cover tunnel, eventually coming out kind of near the meadows, mm -hmm. uh, which would go down to a kind of large interchange at Cameron Toll with an upgraded A sixty eight. Yeah. So this is this is and that would eventually go out to what is where is Sheriff Hall. Yeah. Uh, and it shows the Dalkeith bypass even on this. In as fact, well. Sheriff Hall was probably shown on this in the location that it ultimately ended up at. Yeah. Yeah. And they they had this as motorway. Mm hmm. You know, through here. So imagine that city bypass is a motorway. We've covered that before. Mm. <laughs> so the other thing was they they looked at this uh, Morningside bypass, and this was this kind of intermediate kind of rate um, ring road yeah. that they, mm -hmm. they had in yep. these areas. And then of course at that side you would have had the approach from the M8. Now we've spoken about this before, Stuart. The M8 was actually meant to go all the way into yep. and uh, and kind of meet at where the western um, western approach road. Is and now. we almost built it. As Almost. the West Approach Road in the 1980s. Yeah. Uh, there's a whole story there to talk about as well. Obviously, the the, 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 the the Regional Council let the contract for the construction of the West Approach Road, which was a dual carriageway with limited access that was basically to get traffic from the city centre out to the, the, the west of Edinburgh, Hermiston, very quickly uh, without 
people would have been able to join it. Contract for construction was let. Then the local elections were held. Uh, I believe the Tories were kicked out and Labour won the election and Labour cancelled the contract and had to pay the contractor a considerable amount of money uh, well, for, just, for so, cancelling it. Yeah. So spent all that money and, didn't, yeah, and nothing to show thing. for it. And yeah, then eventually... They have a guided busway along there. Yeah, so that's like. the trams now run along that corridor. They do. Uh, I, we ended up with a, a much watered down western approach, which is that wee road on the old railway line that skips some yep. snakes around Edinburgh, Murrayfield. Edinburgh's uh, best road. Yeah, I, and then Dumpshire on Lothian Road, just next to the big Sheraton Hotel. Hmm. Mm. So, yeah. yes. But yeah, Hermiston Gate, in the form that it's in at the moment, was designed to allow for the M8 to continue, to continue through, all the way through as that West Approach yeah. Road. And ultimately, obviously, that was cancelled and they built the retail park instead. Yeah. But all the other favourites are there. Uh, Calder Road is there. Yeah. Um, it's just one of the, another good road. Draghorn Link. Draghorn Link, which was, which was built mm-hmm. as well. And, of course, the junctions at Lothian Burn and um, Straighton. Yeah, also down all there. On the bypass yeah. and stuff So, like that. by 1975, say, they already knew what the, the the city bypass was going to look like. Although, yeah, it looks here as if it was probably going to be a motorway or certainly a major road. Part of it were going to be motorway. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. judging by, by some of these things. Yeah. So, where does that leave us then? So um, we've got to this stage. The local authorities had changed at this point by the middle of the, or were about to change at yeah. the middle of the 1970s. And this is where I suppose the story kind of flips on to being all about the Edinburgh City Bypass. Yeah. So the Edinburgh City Bypass wasn't built by the Scottish office. It was built by Lothian Regional Council. Yes. Not- just like in, to, just, just for context, before people mm-hmm. say, that's an outrageous. Mm-hmm. That was not unusual. In Scotland, yeah. within the cities, the cities were left to propose their new roads and they were given grant assistance from the Scottish office. 75% so, grant. Yeah. Yeah. So Glasgow, Aberdeen, Dundee, they all built roads in the 60s and the 70s. They handled them themselves and they, they operated them, they maintained them, just like they did in Glasgow until local government reorganisation. So Edinburgh was not a special case. There was, you know, there was no vendetta against Edinburgh or anything no. like that. But there you go. So it, it eventually they decided, after all the kind of public po- opposition and stuff like that, that really the, the, the outer bypass was the only thing that, that could have been built in and, a way. And it's a real so, shame that they were so late to that to come to that realisation. Do you know what it became is, perhaps unlike Glasgow, is it became very politicised in Edinburgh. Yeah. Local elections <clears> were <throat> won and lost on where this route was going to go. Yeah. And it was very similar to the problems that they actually were having in London. If you look at London, had all these ringways and ring road proposals. Loads of people looked at this. There was obviously cons- consultation at the end. And ultimately, Stuart, they didn't build anything. Which segues me on nicely to the conclusion section of um, John Gray's report. So he says, in conclusion... Some of the officials associated with planning within the city are now disillusioned. So remember, he wrote this in 1975. Yeah. Okay. Which was really when this all kind of came apart. Many have served the town since the last war and feel that its full 20 years development plan period has gone by with little to show for their efforts, while there have been continual criticism of anything they have tried to achieve. There is nonetheless cause for optimism, he says. Not only has a good deal been physically, uh, a good deal physically accomplished, but much of the work done in recent decades will flower towards the end of the century, although not perhaps exactly as envisaged by the original <laughs> city planners and engineers. Yeah, twenty-five years is now a long time in human experience, but it is nothing in the life life scale of a town like Edinburgh. Post-war planning and the highway activity in Edinburgh is a springboard for planners of the future. As a result of the cautious Edinburgh approach to a particularly difficult problem of urban planning, a vast storehouse of information has been accumulated and much more now is known about the advanced planning techniques than there was 25 years ago. Where's this massive warehouse of stuff? Yeah. They're not coming to us with that. <laughs> I mean, it's been dribs and drabs with the Edinburgh <clears> stuff and it's certainly not been as kind of... I think it's still together. their dirty little secret. I think they like to hide it away. But there's lots in the archive at, at, at the, the, the library in Edinburgh. Yeah. And we, we should actually say thanks a lot to John Tal, who did a lot of research. John Tal's done a lot of the yeah. legwork, and particularly some of the... And he'll, be, he'll be listening to this, no <clears> doubt. Yeah. But um, it's, we'll, we'll do this a better service, John, on our... Um, <laughs> future ones oh but yes it's just such a massive topic that we might we just wanted to set the vibe just oh, yeah. now 
Um, it says interestingly here as well, the future of the South Side, for example, lies in the comprehensive planning approach, which some of the better examples, early Scottish tenements and other historic buildings are integrated with new residential, commercial and cultural areas in such a fashion to create a sympathetic blend of old and new. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. So he's writing this in 1975, but a lot of these things have kind of come to pass in yeah, some ways. Uh, definitely. You know, and uh, he, he, it's, to be honest, I mean, it goes on. I mean, it's quite, it's quite a read. Yeah. But he does have a, a section here as futurism. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's quite interesting is that he, he actually says some things that really have kind of come to pass, if you don't mind me reading. Go right ahead. So... Peering into the future nowadays is a full-time business and the highway planner must do his best to assess the impact of largely unknown forces on the city's highway plan. Please just note what I'm reading is again from 1975. Other so. genders are available. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> As a result of the recent substantial increase in fuel costs over the annual growth of motor car ownership, which has taken place over the last few decades, has now ceased for the time being. So, of course, he's referring to the oil crisis yeah. you know, that was starting to come in at the time. In addition to an increasing awareness that fossil fuels are finite, coupled with concern that atmospheric pollution has resulted in radical rethinking of many aspects of urban life. Very ahead of his Listen time. Listen to this. Yeah. And we got, we're all talking about net zero now. We're yep. talking about active travel and all these modal shifts. So it says, although there are many futuristic conceptions of public transport for cities yet to be built, the only inventions waiting in the sidelines for an existing town like Edinburgh are more economical versions of the internal combustion engine. Yep. Did we get that? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, so we've yeah. got fuel injection, we've got yeah. little engines now, turbocharged engines and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Yep. And um, they also say the electric car. And we do. Well, there you go. We've got very expensive milk floats out there you he can buy. Now. So... <laughs> Uh, on present showing the electric car and small cars propelled by advanced fuels are more likely to be suitable for use within towns while increasing rail efficiency may claim part of the long distance goods and passenger traffic which until recently had been deserting the railways for the road there may be similar transfer from air travel to rail don't no. know that. Road hauliers, this is interesting, however, are tending to economise on fuel by utilising much larger road transport vehicles. Yeah. Although fewer in number, those juggernauts, is what he calls them, will bring their very own problems as far as traffic management and the environment are concerned. And how right is he? Very right. Because HGVs have only got bigger. Now, oh, from yeah. a road maintenance point of view, That's these things nightmare. are. Yeah, 44 tonnes and, and battering over bridges and, and roads causes all sorts of trouble. Yeah, there you go. Interesting. Yeah. What a fantastic book this is. And what interesting proposals and see how they change. And I think, Stuart, what we've got to do is to make this coherent, unlike mm -hmm. this podcast, yeah. is we've got to we've got to bring out a series of maps so in the kind of forties, fifties, sixties proposals yeah. that we we should publish and we can have an article on this. And we will have an article at some and point. And it can definitely. just show how it changes, but I don't want to I mean maybe I don't want my, my conclusions in some ways, are on this, but I'm going to say this. Mm -hmm. In Edinburgh, a very city, different city from Glasgow, they moaned about the traffic at the time. They wanted a solution. Solutions were presented. Perhaps yeah. not ideal, but they moaned and moaned and moaned and ran out of time, ran out of money, and ultimately got nothing. Yeah. Th that's 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 kind of thing. Now, now you do have the city bypass, but you know what? That is it was a a very overutilised. Yeah. We do have trams, but it's not a complete network. No. And it just seems to me, Stuart, you want to do anything in Edinburgh? It's a battle. Yes. It's a conservative sort of place. It doesn't particularly like a lot of change. No, it doesn't like big modern now, developments. And, you know, we saw that we saw how the St. James <laughs> development was received when, <laughs> when it was proposed and then ultimately finished. And I'm just wondering if anyone who's living in Edinburgh is... Uh, Born and bred Edinburgh is listening to this and thinking, you know what? I'm proud of this. Yeah. We prevented that they might do. I think they are. To you be know, honest, I think Edinburgh's proud of the fact that a democracy in action. Yeah. yeah. Maybe that's. And you know, the thing, right? So there's another. My take in this uh, sort of a focuses on the, the sort of political. Okay. Unlike Glasgow, that, that tended to be dominated by one party for, for years. Labour. Uh, Labour recently, SNP, mm -hmm. now progressives yeah. at one point. Edinburgh tended to change hands politically far more frequently. And I think that's probably one of the reasons that there were so many changes as well through the mm -hmm. years from the 40s to the 50s to the 60s to the 70s because administrations changed. Like you said yourself, 
some of these candidates are standing on a platform of vote for me, I'll get this changed or stopped. Yeah, so the road won't come through here and if then you it vote happens for me. again and it happens again and it happens again. But you know, ultimately, it comes down to for me is that I always got the impression that Edinburgh's officials and the planning department, the highways department, and the councillors didn't really understand the local residents in the way that Glasgow did. Because Glasgow, from the outset, was very open about the roads proposals and the comprehensive development areas. Now, it's easy for us to look back now and go, oh, they were all terrible, they were all terrible. However, mm -hmm. at the time, people were pretty well informed in Glasgow about what the plans were. All the way back to Bruce, where they had a huge exhibition at the Kelvin Hall, you know, this saying this is what the future is going to be, this is what the roads are going to be, the houses, mm -hmm. the schools, all the rest of it. And that continued through the 50s and into the 60s. Glasgow was very open about it. All right, a lot of it didn't happen. They, they, they responded to negative feedback. Wholesale demolition of the city centre, Scrapped no, very that quickly. Wasn't happen. Yeah. Um, other things, however, satellite housing schemes, new houses, new schools, all that sort of stuff went mm. forward. Uh, and the roads were part of that. Okay, it's easy now to look back and go, well, did we really need an urban motorway? Let's bear in mind that the, the, the people opposed to the motorways in Glasgow at that time were, were, were talking a handful of people. Mm -hmm. All right, later in the 70s, as Edinburgh also found that was more vocal and a bit more organised. But through the 50s and the 60s, there was much more of an acceptance of what was getting done and an appreciation for that. So yeah. I think Glasgow have to be commended also glasgow brought the experts in immediately they knew 1959 we can't do this guys we don't have people here who can, who can do this for us let's bring in experts scott wilson kirkpatrick comes in yeah they start it they do it edinburgh much later to the party eight nine years down the line things already started to change much less money available they missed the boat they glasgow did. had that one period that, that you had an opportunity a window of opportunity from 1960 to 1975 where the stars aligned and money was you, sloshing about you could get things built you could get and by the time built. edinburgh started yeah. to come around and get approved plans it was too late it was yeah. far too late and the oil crisis ultimately killed it mm -hmm. and you know what is the other thing that and people always complain about the city bypass Ultimately, they were so late to understanding that the city bypass was the one buildable part of the proposals. By the time they did move it forward, done that last. the situation had moved on so much that the, the public yeah. spending had been slashed back to so, the bone. So let's just, um, I don't know, have a, have, a, have a think here and think that maybe if they done the bypass first, maybe if they looked right in the 60s, yeah. we could have got a dual three or four lane motorway. You, you very probably would have. Let's be honest, if it had been Glasgow and they had been looking at it and it had been a Scott Wilson or a Fairhurst or someone like that coming in and advising they, but they would probably have said as a minimum, a minimum, a dual three lane motorway. Yeah. Right, fully grade separated from end to end. Right? That's probably what the city bypass would have mm. been had it been done by one of the Glasgow based consultants. Right? Yeah. But because Lothian Ro Region were having to do it themselves and they, they had no money, they were getting a very limited investment from the Scottish office um, at that point. No one was. Mm. Um, Didn't they, thre the, they threatened to build the bypass as a single, single carriage. In fact, one of the contracts was only amended at the last minute to upgrade it to dual carriageway. Yeah. So, you know, so limited was the funding available. Plus, it was built over a period of about 15 years. Yeah. You know, the last the, section was the, 1990. The first bit was... Pragmatic approach, though. They had it nice in the little chunks and sections. Uh, but, you know? Yeah, well, little chunks and sections are no good at the time. And, you know, what's buildable. Yeah. You know? Um, so, yeah, they missed they, they missed an opportunity. It could have been... The outer bypass could have been much, much more. Had mm -hmm. they just accepted early on, by the way, this is the we're not we gonna, We're not going to be able to put a, a Glasgow-esque system through yeah. a medieval city. Anybody yeah. who ever thought you were going to be able to build a motorway around Princess Street or the Meadows or any of these areas was completely detached from reality, mm. even, even then. Even then. Although, Glasgow Corporation did it with Glasgow Cross and Glasgow Green. Yes. Um, but the reasons for that, they knew that was controversial. Mm. Um, but by the time they started to appreciate that, things had changed and they didn't want to go through the process of altering the planning boundaries. Mm. And that was kind of the reason they stuck with it. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. If, um, would you, right now, if you, uh, if you were God, would you build any of these things just quick overnight and they wouldn't be there? No. I don't think I'd do the innermost, but what I would do is, is an upgrade of a Western approach. Yeah. And I would have that intermediate ring, like that morning side bypass. I think that's a good idea. My view has always been that if you the West approach road was opposed and cancelled for the sake of it. It was a decent proposal. Right. It would have blended very well with the surroundings. Because it was right up against... Yeah, a, a railway. A railway. And it would have got traffic off of Kerstorfen Road, A8, yeah. and called the Road A71. It's just like the Barnton Bypass. That was yeah. hard up against the railway and it was cancelled. And another route that was opposed for the sake of opposing it. Yeah. Because it went against 
the then the policies yeah. at the time and uh, you know uh, well, for the sake of beat a stick to beat the, the the existing administration with and i think edinburgh does suffer as a result of that because as we've said on this podcast many many times we can get from glasgow to edinburgh on the emmy off peak mm-hmm. uh, quicker than it will take you to get from calder or hermiston to edinburgh city center <laughs> Because exactly. of how you know, you because of slow moving it is yeah. now. Obviously, policies have changed, and, we, and people don't want cars going into the city centre. Mm. Fair enough. Well, they are investing in the tram. Yeah. I mean, they they recently and they've got a very good year, bus network. They have a very good bus network, and it's it's kept within public ownership. Yeah. It is affordable, and mm-hmm. I'm a big fan of the tram. Yeah, I know people moaned about. It. People all moan about the tram. We like they moan, the tram. They, they moan about when they're going to propose to build the boat and when they build it. But when they have the tram, they love it. They love it. Yep, they're all over it. I've seen these people in Leith. Mm-hmm. And there was, oh, our businesses, and now they're all like, this is great. We've now, well, yeah. yeah. You know? There has to be a wee bit of pain before you get the game. Of course. You know, maybe uh, maybe they did get it. Maybe it's just the way the press has put it across. But, yeah. you know, it's it's good they're doing these things. But, you know, I'm going to say this ultimately about Edinburgh. Edinburgh's a, a prisoner of its past. Yes. In some ways, because it never done some of these little improvements here and there. And if they, they as you say, focused on the bypass, we would have got a much better bypass. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's ultimately, I think that's the takeaway from this, that we could have had a much better bypass than we've ended if, up with. If they focus on the other things, yeah. in another audience. You know? Exactly. So there you go. Thank you. Very interesting. Yeah. I'm sure people will be interested in it. Uh, I think so. Um, great great one for for an article mm-hmm. on the website. Yeah. And then maybe we can revisit this in future because people are going to come in with this and go, I worked on this. I was involved yep. in this. I lived where they were going to put this road. Um, and oh you guys never mentioned this that's great mm-hmm. if you have any of that information please 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 get in touch yes please absolutely a good opportunity to thank our sponsors absolutely of course uh, Eastford Excavations HBS Scotland for their support and allowing us to continue with these podcasts fantastic lately thank you very yes. much guys and a special shout out to the Road Transport History Association um, mm-hmm. as well um, who, who we've been talking to recently so thank you to them yes uh, all these podcasts well over 50 of them now in fact are all We've online. sat here doing this 50 times. More than 50. There's only 50 online. We've taken some of the early ones off because they were so awful. <laughs> um, <laughs> Mostly my ones. Uh, but <laughs> No, no. No, no. No, it has been a long time. But I hope people are still enjoying them. I enjoy think they are. Them. And the numbers yeah. seem to suggest that they are. I think there's been over 50. 50,000 individual listeners now of this podcast. Over, yeah. Over so make sure if you if you like them, give us a review. Yes, please please leave the reviews because it's a good way to, to get us the exposure yeah, and, and show people that, that we're there. And, and people like Apple and, and Spotify and Podbean might actually tag us and do a review of our podcast if, they, if they're made aware of us you know, through yeah. these reviews. So please, please do that. Uh, and of course, social media continues to thrive. Absolutely. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all there for you. Mm-hmm. Um, new photos every day. I got a nice compliment today from someone I was talking to about the archives. I'm enjoying the photos. A recent uh, follower of Instagram. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, so that was. That I was, was going to say we we seem to get a lot of our interaction mostly on Facebook. To be honest with you, but, yeah. Um, it's it's good people like me. When are we doing TikTok? No TikTok. No. Nope. No, we're not going to get with the signs. Nope. We're not no going to have a little, I, a little nope. dance video with nope. that with that annoying voiceover that they have. No, nope. nope. not having you dancing on a bridge uh, for TikTok. <laughs> no, no, no way. That's fine. I, I despise TikTok on a, a subatomic level, so I'm happy with that's that. That's good. So do I. We're fine. We're in agreement <laughs> on that one. Anyway, anyway. if this podcast, uh, if you're listening to this podcast before the second of July. Uh, you should know that we will be at the Glasgow Vintage Vehicle Trust in Bridgeton on Sunday the 2nd of July uh, same as last year come and see us then if you like I forgot all about that that's something to look forward to it is indeed so we will be there and there are other events coming later in the summer which we will confirm in due course if you wish to come and say hello yes so that's all good so all right. anything else we want to say nothing at all no. just thank you very much Stuart for this fantastic discussion we've had and Indeed. I look forward to the next episode. And the next episode, yes, wonderful episode, mm-hmm. 60th anniversary of the Clyde Tunnel. Yes, Scotland's only true tunnel. Yes, and we have a number of celebrations planned mm-hmm. for that, and we're working with Glasgow City Council in collaboration on those. So yes. stay tuned. New booklet, just a wee hint, there might be another booklet coming. <laughs> One to add to the collection. Yes, yes, so watch out for that, and we'll speak to you very soon. Speak to you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>